uh, in the first part of this webinar, we will talk about uh, biophotonics against COVID, so all the technologies against COVID. And the second part, we will cover some of the, of the tissue optics concepts with Satantana Kunuglu that is already present here too. So this first, first part, so uh, I hope to convince you that uh, biophotonics contributions uh, during the COVID outbreak have, have uh, ranged for, uh, from wearable technologies. Uh, there, there has been some connected telehealth with it, uh, a lot of remote disease monitoring, and some of the technologies that uh, are being automated and making new uh, users empowered so that, that they can be independent with the technologies they have in hand, with, for example, with smartwatches and these things. Um, and biophotonics is also used a lot for uh, disinfection and decontamination in many places, which is obviously very relevant when we have a lot of uh, coronavirus infections around the world. So uh, if we start with the context, uh, as you may be aware of now, um, we have a lot of types of transmission for, for coronavirus disease. And uh, this, this transmission will be mostly with airborne, airborne routes, uh, with droplets that are in the air that can go from sneezing, coughing, and so on. Uh, and uh, contact routes that would be direct, just with bi a biofluid from some person, or with indirect routes with a uh, virus that was remaining in some surface of the objects. So because of this, these types of transmission and because the, of the virulence that uh, the contagious disease that is really high in COVID-19, the World Health Organization issued the guidance for the infection prevention and control strategies. And these were applied for everywhere, including the social distancing and all, and this changed completely the procedures in medicine. So if you think about how people were dealing with it, there would be a, lo a lot of need for pr personal protective equipment. So the medical staff would obviously wouldn't be uh, harmed or, or diseased. And also um, there, there needed to be a lot of physicians and hospital beds and negative pressure rooms. And automatically because of the increase of the number of cases worldwide, we had a, sor a, short of, a shortage of those. So uh, with the, especially with the shortage of PPE, then if the medical staff starts to uh, not be available anymore, there could be a crisis on the medical system. And uh, th this was on one of the things that came up and is still going on in some parts of the world. Uh, we will talk about uh, some of these aspects here. So uh, with the safe distance that, uh, that we needed to, to respect with the guidelines, then a lot of medical procedures would be uh, totally eradicated. So for example, light therapies or skin treatments, endoscopy, colonoscopy, and surgical procedures, dental procedures, or anything that could be, um, that could make the doctors in, in contact with biofluids or, or any type of uh, transmission routes, then, then would, be, uh, would be procedures that needed some warning uh, with just uh, with either PP or the uh, or not having contact or just not doing the procedures. So even um, conventional medical examinations, such as when you get a uh, blood pressure cuff, uh, 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 or when you you examine the the patients with an otoscope, or when you just take the temperature of a normal thermometer, and even when you go to meet your doctor in a medical appointment, all of those just changed completely during the pandemic. Um, you would probably not meet your doctor anymore, for example. And uh, here, the, the optical technologies would, would be very useful. For example, there, there are ways to measure um, blood pressure remotely or even respiration rate or other types of patient vital signs. Um, but here we will talk more about the oxygenation and the, the temperature because these are more related to the fever and obviously the, the pulmonary distress that comes with some critical conditions of, uh, generated by COVID-19. So if we think 
about the temperature. We will not use a normal thermometer, for example. We would use uh, the infrared imaging to measure fever. And this could be with a, a thermometer. We, we would have some point measurements or uh, we, we can use infrared imaging really to measure all the regions of the body and even cover several people at the same time. Uh, the infrared technology is based on the radiation we, we emit because of uh, the vibration of our molecules. And uh, if you remember some of your physics classes, you remember that this radiation is, uh, is higher, it has a higher intensity and also is shifted to shorter wavelengths, the higher the temperature gets. So, um, for example, this sun would, would emit ultraviolet because it's really, really hot. So, um, if you think about this technology, then it is possible to measure absolute temperature. And this is done with uh, uh, infrared bolometers, uh, bolometers that are infrared sensors. And this is based on, on three types of effects. One is, is the semiconductor. Um, in this case, the radiation changes the current and you can measure the, the signals with the, this change. Uh, there is a thermoelectric effect. In this case, uh, the radiation will change the voltage in the sensor and the pyroelectric effects where the radiation will change the resistance there. So this technology can, can be very compact. So we have uh, very compact infrared cameras and this uh, these can be done with CMOS uh, fabrication process where we have chips, for example, those we, we do in Chindo, for example, uh, and this technology can be integrated in medical devices. A uh, unit of the micro microbolometer array could be, uh, could be done with infrared absorber on the top, uh, followed by a reflective, uh, a reflective layer on the bottom. And then uh, there would be a um, uh, readout circuit in the substrate just below that. So uh, this is the structure that we, you can see here. And uh, this, uh, each, each of these structures would then uh, be surrounded by, by vacuum. So to prevent uh, the heat loss, which, would, uh, which is very important for, for accurate readings of temperature. And if you think about the application of those, then we are talking about the measurement of absolute temperature. So um, if we want to be very precise, we also, uh, the technology validation for the fever detection would be uh, done in acclimatized rooms or, or isolation rooms first, where we have lower uh, heat exchange rates. And if, if the, there is a directed airflow, then it's possible to foresee where the changes would be because of, of the airflow. So uh, if we expand those for uh, the screening in crowded areas, then we would have, uh, we can have the monitoring of uh, a number of people in the in outside environments, so outdoors. And uh, it's possible to, to see, to have uh, face recognition with the cameras around the world and uh, some reporting for specific people. Uh, implement, implementing these technologies would uh, have some privacy issues. So the, this would be something that uh, is being uh, thought about, but it's, it's not being implemented yet until having the concept, consent of everyone. Um, so if we think about more specific technologies, so uh, looking at probing specifically the genetic material of, of the COVID, then we would have uh, conventional te COVID tests with the nasal and throat swab. And in this case, uh, the, there would be a swab that would collect the samples and the cells that are infected and uh, the viruses in the biofluids. There, there are also the possibility of saliva tests that were recently approved uh, even by, by FDA in the US. And um, it, with, with collecting this, this sample material, then the, the sample material would go for uh, the amplification of the gen genetic material 
uh, in the case of the virus, it's the RNA, but for some of the cells that are infected, there could be the DNA as well. Uh, everything is converted to a DNA and amplified, and then there is the sequencing afterwards uh, with polymerase chain, chain reaction. But what they use to sequence, those would be fluorescence. It can be either something that uh, is, is sequencing the nucleotides itself, so looking at the RNA of the viruses, copies of the RNA of the viruses, and uh, up to a certain amount, uh, then there, that uh, patient wouldn't be totally infected and may not uh, be, may be asymptomatic. But uh, after a number of uh, copies of the virus's RNA, then there would be uh, some of the symptoms would show up. This would be a, a clinical uh, case of infection. And if you if you think about uh, technology that you wouldn't need. Um, you wouldn't need a, a, a agent, a chemical agent, to label your samples. Uh, then it is possible to do this just with light, with uh, vibrational spectroscopy. And uh, in vibrational spectroscopy, we are looking at the vibration of the the bones, the chemical bones of the molecules, and this is very sensitive to very specific to the molecules we are looking at. So um, this technology, uh, one of these technologies is the, the fast Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. So the FTIR, as you, you may know, this, this uh, technique was already created in, in the beginning of the past century. And some of the, the equipments were already produced in the 1950s. So the technology is already very mature and uh, now we have portable spectrometers that uh, that are uh, that require a minimal amount of sample, and uh, they can be placed in in airports or hospitals and uh, several and uh, several crowded places like post offices and this this type of place um, with uh, with biofluids that are analyzed there such as saliva, then there it would be possible to identify the, the, COVID, uh, the COVID patients or normal patients just by looking at the reading there without any chemical agent. So there's uh, one of the propositions and it, is pos it would be possible to have uh, some microfluid, microfluidic chips, so Lebelma chip devices that would, uh, would then um, uh, be be distributed to several parts of the world, and um, and then this could be a technology that is uh, that allows a high throughput screening there. And with automation, all this technology wouldn't have operational costs. For example, another proposition of uh, of technology would be using Raman spectroscopy, and in, it, this is another vibrational spectroscopy. So a very very molecular specific, very molecular sensitive. And uh, the, one of the advantages of the Raman spectroscopy over, over FTIR would be that the, the signals are water free. So um, it's not only for the biofluids, but if you are analyzing cells, you could look at biomarkers inside the cells, for example, several proteins or even nucleic acids. And by monitoring uh, target biomarkers inside the cells, we, uh, it would be possible to look at the progression of the infected cells by the virus and then understand a bit more about the origin of disease and propose some other types of diagnosis methods and propose new treatments based on these biomarkers, knowing what's the origin of the disease. Uh, if you're using Raman spectro spectroscopy, there would be another proposition there with breath analysis. In this case, uh, Raman spectroscopy could be used to detect uh, volatile organic compounds, which are gases, in this case, uh, gases that are generated by um, the, the tissue, the disease tissue of the patient, so the infected cells. and these, these gases would be, then be released by, by the lungs, in the lungs of the, the person. And it is possible, to, it would be possible to uh, detect 
then in, with chips, with surface enhanced uh, Raman spectroscopy, which will amplify the, the Raman spectroscopy signal. And uh, if, if this lab on a chip device is incorporated in respirators, it is possible to concentrate the volatile organic compounds so that they become detectable and it is possible to detect COVID-19 in an early stage. So uh, these would be some of the propositions of technology that biophotonics is capable of doing. And if we, if we think about all the potential that biophotonics brought uh, for solutions uh, for, against COVID-19, then we could be thinking also about the telemedicine applications. So um, there, there will be several telehealth applications that allow allows us, such as uh, with smartwatches or or uh, pulse oximeters and several other medical equipment that where the the doctor could monitor the patient's vital signs remotely and. The patients could inform the doctor when there is a, a abnormal reading or some type of um, some type of some type of abnormal signal from those devices. And with telemedicine, there would be less problem with the shortage of the, the medical staff too, and there there wouldn't be need for all the contacts and these things that are impaired by the pandemic. So some of the technological um, aspects of telemedicine were actually uh, raised by, by the governments and the doctors worldwide. Um, some of those would be uh, related to health insurance regulations. So there are some issues with respecting the privacy of the patient when uh, monitoring uh, all the vital signs and uh, sending the relevant health data to the doctors. So there, there shouldn't, for example, there shouldn't be any image or any any type of uh, personal information when this uh, these technologies uh, these data will be sent to the doctors, and um, the doctors are very interested in having more user friendly technologies. So, um, for example, so the clinicians are not really uh, interested in carrying many additional devices to to probe you know to probe. Uh, to have information about a small population of their patients, or uh, also the the clinicians are not really interested in, in having uh, uh, of being informed about every abnormal reading that raises up. So they are interested in looking at really where the, the, there is the sign and what the action they need to take, so they they can actually be more efficient and and. Uh, and let's say give more, uh, give better advice for every patient. So there is something that would require interaction, early interaction between manufacturers and consumers for the instrument design. And this is the, the consideration that has been uh, raised in, 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 in the past months. So uh, if you think about all these considerations, uh, some of the, the current technologies already meet them so um, if you think about the, the wearable devices, uh, one of them would be uh, uh, what we, when we monitor the blood oxygenation heart rates with pulse oximeters. And this technology is already available in this, the smart watches, for example. So uh, this is uh, one example of very successful technology that can be implemented and uh, used with all those technological aspects uh, and pulse oximeter uh, not, not only this type of technology but wearable devices could be used uh, not only in watches but could be even uh, put in your shoes or glasses or almost uh, in, in several or almost everywhere in your in your body that where you you can wear it so um, if we if we think about the pulse oximetry then we we have uh, the oxygen saturation ranges, uh, for example, for healthy individuals between 95 and 100%. Uh, around the 90%, there is already some pulmonary stress, and lower than than that, 
then there would be some acute illnesses such as uh, it's common from pneumonia or a heart failure. And um, if, if there is no action uh, on that, this, the oxygen levels may drop even more. So below 80%, there would be some impaired mental functioning and altered con consciousness, for example. Uh, so it is very important to act fast when monitoring the oxygenation of the patients. And the, this is one of, of the technologies that can be used for monitoring the, the, the COVID patients. Also, uh, in addition to, to the infrared imaging, for example. Um, other technology propositions would be related to, to uh, critical conditions. Uh, one of them is the acute respiratory distress syndrome. The, this is a condition uh, of, set, uh, of uh, the vulnerable populations in COVID, in, in the, among the COVID patients. And this is caused by a uh, uh, raised permeability of the, the capillaries in the alveoli. So when this perme permeability um, is higher, then there is a, a leakage of fluids inside the alveoli. And this causes damages to the wall and the membranes of the cells there. And because of this, there is no oxygen uptake. So a biophotonics technologies can actually target the leakage of the fluid, the, the fluid that is leaking there, which is rich in protein material and neutrophilic material. Uh, and the, the part where the, the oxygen is not really um, uh, and there's when there is no oxygen to be uptaken by the cells of the patient. So uh, one of these technologies would be the gasine scattering, scattering media absorption spectroscopy or GASMAS. This is one of the techniques that uh, are are being um, are being developed are being uh, researched by our group, also mostly for for um, the the preterm babies in, in our group. Uh, this would be with Andrea Pacheco and Santan Kunuglu. And, and then we, we would have uh, this technology that is based on the, ab the absorption, of the narrow absorption of the oxygen gas inside the lungs. So if you, if you see the, the absorption spectrum here, there, there would be very narrow peaks related to the oxygen and probing those peaks, it it would um, it would be a very narrow peak compared to the absorption in tissue. So if there is a an intensity that that is attenuated by the tissue with no oxygen, this would be uh, uh, some sort of reading that you would we would get with a very broad absorption. If there is oxygen, there would be a uh, there would be an absorption peak in this region and then uh, decrease in intensity here. Uh, this decrease would be different for healthy and diseased patients. So if there is 90% oxygen there or 100% oxygen, there would be a difference in the, in the death of this peak. And this can be, can be implemented with wearable, uh, in wearable devices too. So uh, if you can wear this in the, in the chest, for example, and the, these measurements could be done either, either in reflectance mode or re remittance mode. So uh, also, so in addition to the oxygen measurements, or oxygen gas measurements, then there, there we can look at the fluid there as, as we, we were telling you. So this, would, this could be done with near infrared spectroscopy um, this would be uh, an uh, this would um, ensure that we we take the advantage of the uh, optical window. So this is the window of where the wave where we have highest light penetration. This this would happen between uh, for for wavelengths uh, higher than seven hundred more or less, um, and in this case we we would have either low absorption and low scattering or just low scattering and the light penetration increases because of this. So in the near infrared range, we can have 
signals from water, proteins, uh, fat, and so on. And it is possible, obviously, to to detect the fluid accumulation because it's mostly based on water and protein signals. Um, with near infrared spectroscopy, there is the possibility of probing a very wide wavelength range, and this means if we look at uh, the a bit of the blood absorption in the end of the in the beginning of the near infrared range then we would also be able to monitor the oxygenation in deep tissue layers. So it would be something that monitors both oxygenation and the, the fluid accumulation. And this, can be, uh, and this can be done to monitor the treatments. So once the patient is being treated, it, the, the signals, the fluid signal should lower and the oxygenation should higher and until it's, it's in the normal levels. So all these, these technologies could be used. Um, uh, both technologies are based on near infrared um, illumination, and this can be combined with therapy. In this case, we have a, an expression called Theranostics, where we have both diagnosis and therapy in the same procedure. And the way it would work is like there is a near, near infrared illumination and detection with the same device and the same illumination can be used to treat the patient. So uh, if you remember what we talked about photodynamic therapy in the first webinar, then we, we, uh, it is possible to design the photosensitizers. So the chemical agents that will bind to the virus, uh, specifically to the virus, structures and with this it is possible then to shine light in a specific wavelength of the photosensitizer the photosensitizer will be led to uh, an excited state and it decays it relaxes to a triplet state where it can transfer the energy to oxygen molecules and oxygen can be turned into singlet oxygen which is highly reactive or it can also transfer the uh, an electron to uh, reactive oxygen species. And all these, these molecules are really reactive. So they, they will react with almost everything that is around them. This includes the RNA of the virus. And this is the way the RNA, uh, the virus will be destroyed since its genetic material is gone after that. So uh, with this, it, it would be possible to having in, in one procedure both diagnosis and treatment. And the, this would be a very powerful thing if, if it can be achieved during these COVID times. So now switching a bit the gears to the disinfection and the contamination part. So we, uh, it is, we have the, the ultraviolet technology that is mostly used for surface disinfection in hospital rooms. And it, it can also be used in food industry, even in pharmaceutical industry to, for the contamination of the environmental surfaces. And it has been even more popular now with, with the pandemic because uh, environmental surface disinfection has been used in very crowded places such as supermarkets, airports, or if the industries that are, are important for, for uh, our own lives during during the pandemic, such as the pharmaceutical industry and food industry, and post offices, for example. Um, there there are some some propositions of using use of UV technology for um, the contamination of respirators or the masks that you can wear for uh, for COVID. Uh, in in terms of if you want to reuse that respirator or personal protective equipment. So um, in this case, then there should be some, some aspects when we are um, targeting the shortage of PPE by reusing, the, the, uh, by reusing them. And uh, ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet technologies can be used with the, in the ultraviolet germicidal irradiation equipment. These tools are usually based on light emitting diodes. 
So LEDs or, or UVGI lamps, LEDs are much smaller, so they, they are flexible in, in, in shape. You could fit them in many places. And the, this is suitable for, for the general cases now because the hostels are really crowded. So there is actually no space for putting many, many equipment there. Um, then there would be uh, the UVGI lamps. In this case, they are big, but it's possible, they, they are more powerful. It's possible also to uh, make big uh, structures so they can, we can have high throughputs decontamination. And, and in this case, the, the contamination is much, uh, the decontamination is much faster because the, the lamps are more powerful too. So um, some aspects of it would be having enough power for the microbial inactivation there. And this decontamination time for the current technologies is usually between 30 seconds to 30 minutes. So it varies a lot. The powers of the lamps uh, are uh, around 10 watts. And the UVC radiation of some of the lamps produces ozone, which is toxic for us. So uh, if there is anything that generates that, then it is not safe to stay around and the UV also shouldn't be exposed, uh, the skin and eyes shouldn't be exposed to UV light. So um, with the LEDs that have more flexible formats, it's possible to avoid some of these problems, uh, but there, there are no industry standards for those. For ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet germicidal radiation lamps, they have high efficiency a high efficiency long lifetime, but they may create ozone and it's a bit difficult to restore them. And um, both of those technologies could be used for illuminating the masks from every angle or from two angles and decontaminate everything on the surface. So uh, because of these technologies have uh, are not available everywhere. So there have been some people that have done some homemade stuff so um, the, this would be including the, the adapting the biosafety cabinets or film hoods with UVC, uh, doing some sterilization boxes, or either using a daylight therapy boxes for pressurizers, which, which is based on UVB. So uh, one aspect that came back after using all these technologies was that UVC is actually um, something that may affect the electrostatic, electrostatic charges of propylene masks. So this, this actually compromises the respiratory integrity. Uh, and we, uh, it's not sure how many times or how much you can illuminate and decontaminate PPE with UVC, which is what was mostly used for decontaminating vir the virus then, the virus surfaces. So um, with the, then since UVC is, is, a, is something that affects the masks a lot, the, this uh, propo proposition with the, using the UVB has been, has been raised. So then the, the, there are people researching that and there will be also uh, some people that are looking to the optimum irradiation times so that the, there is the contamination, but without damaging the respirator. So with this, uh, I hope I, I, can, I could convince you that the biophotonics contributions during the outbreak range from the wearables, wearable technology, the telehealth system, and increasing the remote disease in monitoring worldwide, and also uh, empowering the users with automated devices and that they can use independently and the with the disinfection and the contamination technology that uh, that allows us to have the the surfaces that are safe for for touching or for contact in many places so i'd like to to show just some of the references you have this presentation afterwards if you want to contact me it's here and um, we have wrote some of the propositions against against uh, COVID using biophotonics against COVID. These would be these publications here, 
um, you have uh, this in a copy, but if you are interested in reading more about those, just let me know. Uh, I, uh, I can give you access to that, or you can also see this in my research page profile and these, these um, social media. So uh, thank you again for, for listening, and I am open for questions.